Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Juliana Forlano. This is the Political Voices Network. First of all, I'm very happy that you're here with me today. If you're just finding me, hooray, welcome aboard. And if you've been with us for the last few episodes or followed me from somewhere else, again, I'm very happy to have you here. We're going to be doing the headlines, and then we have an interview with an economist, a good old Dean Baker's joining us from the Center for Economic and Policy Research, basically answers all of my questions and hopefully some of yours about what really is going on with the economy and why aren't we seeing it reported properly. All that and more coming up on the podcast, so stay tuned. Starting off with the headlines, this week all eyes have been on Donald Trump's arraignment on his January 6th indictment. Look here on CNN Politics, you can watch live. You can watch him walk into the courtroom. You can watch him wipe the cocaine off from underneath his nose. You can watch every single thing. As part of special counsel Jack Smith's investigation, Trump was charged with four counts, one of conspiracy to defraud the United States. Like that was the whole presidency. Kidding. Uh, The other was conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Another obstruction of uh, and attempt to obstruct an official proceeding and a conspiracy against rights. Now, to my knowledge, Trump is yet to comment on the day's events. But if I were a betting lady, I'd say the words baseless claims, highly partisan, Hunter Biden's laptop would feature prominently in his speech. That's right. I I would put a money on it. And still, of course, there's no indications after all of this that his supporters are in any way turned off by him or any of what he's done. Uh, Remember when Trump was overheard saying he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and wouldn't lose voters? The man was correct. He basically did that. But instead of shoot someone, it was have a mob try to lynch a vice president. And instead of on Fifth Avenue, it was on the Capitol steps. But pretty much, pretty much there's that. Now, I, you know, pundits have been saying there's not, there's no real good way for Trump to escape this series of indictments um, that he is facing and now arraignments. Fox News is floating the idea that Trump should plead insanity. Now, personally, I don't think his ego would allow that, but I do think he is insane. (laughs) For legal purposes in the case, an insanity plea would mean that he does he didn't know that he lost the election. So he was just going on about saying it's not true. But Jack Smith has already proven that that isn't the case. He has all the evidence there for it. It's in the 45-page indictment if you feel like a nice beach read. One fly in the ointment here on the insanity plea might be that is it possible that Trump is just so deeply, deeply narcissistic that he can't even imagine or process the fact that people don't want him or don't like him, you know, like his mother didn't. <laughs> that that would be a type of insanity, but not uh, one that legally stands up in court as pertains to this case. So as the country, the country stays on pins and needles watching for a potential justice to be meted out. A lot of the coverage in the news has been about how he could still run for president from prison. I don't know if he would still be an effective president from prison. I mean, would that Vladimir Putin come to prison uh, to meet him? Would, 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 would prisoner slash pre- uh, president Trump be able to have more than one phone call per day? How would that look exactly? Or would they just put, you know, bars around the desk at the Oval Office? I don't even want to think about it. I do think even the Republicans, if he goes to jail, it just might be a bridge too far because some of them are actually concerned with forwarding the national security state and Uh, all of those other things that Republicans love to do. And Trump would not be effective at that. Uh, I don't, you know, Trump would be effective at dismantling democracy. 
He's also done, he's already done many things to do that. But I, I don't think focusing on whether he can be, you know, president from prison is a good idea. He will still run no matter what, because as I've said before, his running is just a grift to try to get money. And now he really needs it because he's got to pay off all these lawyers and sexual assault suits and all these things. <laughs> Oy, settlements he's got to pay off. Meanwhile, in other news, oh wait, there was no other news. Nothing else. No other news. Okay, sure, there's a war, a death sentence for one of America's mass shooters, and the UN Secretary General has welcomed us all to the era of global boiling. But dang, no one's paying any attention because we want to see justice prevail not only for Trump, but for all of what Trump represents. And I don't just mean the MAGAs. I mean the millionaire, billionaire types who have been screwing the regular working person of this country for decades. We would like to see that cabal of the rich brought to an end. And I, I do think in addition to saving democracy, uh, or at least saving it enough so that we can continue to save it. I had a good conversation um, on a podcast the other day where I discussed what I think needs to be on the table. The fact that democracy was in peril way before Trump. The peril of democracy is what allowed Trump to get in into politics in the first place. Since I left college, I have been working on campaign finance reform. Clearly, I have not been as effective as, say, the Koch brothers or some of these other millionaires and billionaires, but uh, we need campaign finance reform. We need to overturn the Supreme Court statutes that say that money equals free speech. We need to do, we need to, you know, exit lobbyists from Capitol Hill. We need to do quite a few things to separate uh, corporation and state. And that would go a long way to preserving the democracy that was hanging by a thread before Trump got in. But if he continues, you know, if he, it, if he gets let off the hook, which I don't see as, as happening now, if he gets let off the hook, uh, from these things, we're going to be in big trouble in terms of democracy here. So all eyes have been have been on that and again rightfully so but there was one other story one other story the fact that the dow jones industrial average fell more than 300 points after fitch the ratings agency downgraded the us credit rating from triple a to double a plus that's right we are a double a plus not too shabby but still my 401k took a hit or it would have if I had one. <laughs> the Independent Comedians Union hasn't secured retirement benefits for us yet. Fitch downgraded the U.S. because of what they said is our sharp political divisions, exemplified by the past brinksmanship over the debt ceiling that no one is talking about. Especially, no one's talking about not only that it happened in the past because, whew, we passed that one and we're okay, but guess what? It's coming up again in September. That's correct. It was punted down the, down the, kick the can down the, the time line. And in September, we're going to face that again. And no one's talking about it. Be, I don't know why. Maybe because we're busy talking about justice being brought to the insurrectionist in chief. Or maybe because they don't want to ruin your vacation? I don't know. Perhaps it's because we only like to talk about things when they are extremely imminent and super scary so that we can all stay in a state of fear forever. But that is coming up. I had several questions about the economy. And in our next segment... I asked those questions of Dean Baker from the Center for Economic and Policy Research, and guess what? He answers them. We talk about the effect on climate change. We talk about why the Fed is raising the rate, whatever. Coming up next in the interview section, you're listening to The Juliana Forlano Show. Please subscribe and hit the like button and leave your comments. That helps this show get everywhere, and it makes me feel good about my life. <laughs> so please do so.
This is the Political Voices Network coming up next to the interview. So how is the U.S. economy doing? That's a question I had after Jerome Powell raised the interest rates yet again in order to try to keep inflation at bay, even though inflation is reportedly basically at bay. So what's going on? Dean Baker, senior economist for the Center for Economic and Policy Research, is joining me. Dean writes the column, Beat the Press, where he basically gives us the reality behind some of today's not-so-accurate economic reportings. Stay tuned for my interview. Not only did we talk about interest rates rising, but we talked about the effect on the economy of the climate chaos that we are seeing. The answer he gave was actually quite surprising. All that and why a latte is $6 at Starbucks and $2 in Europe. Coming up next, stay tuned. Dean, thanks so much for joining me on the program. Thanks a lot for having me on. Well, let's start uh, with the interest rate hikes. The Fed raised them again last week. Do you see any inaccuracies in how the media is reporting on this issue? Well, I think sometimes they don't report this as a choice. And the point here, and they've been better on this than in years past, that you'd see, oh, the Fed was forced to raise rates. Well, the Fed is never forced to raise rates. To my knowledge, no one's got a gun to anyone's head. So they review the evidence and they make their call, you know, their judgment call. And they've been better, the media have been better about making that Point, that there are differences, economists, different economists, different people on the Fed feel differently. And they've been better about making the point that this is a choice, but there's still kind of a sense that, okay, they're forced. And again, even if you think it's the right choice, they're not forced. And I think it is important that the media always report that here you have the, uh, the members of the Fed's Open Market Committee, the 12 members, and they're making a call. They're looking at the data, looking at the evidence, and based on their judgment, they're deciding raise rates, and mm. they could decide not. And it is important that people understand this is a choice. It's never something forced on them. Do you think, I mean, I feel like the the Fed's interest rates uh, and what they do with them get an outsized an outsized coverage on, in financial media more so than other things that will affect the economy, such as, you know, President Biden's, I mean, uh, student loan forgiveness and these other, the things that the Biden administration is doing. Am I am I misperceiving? No, I, I think there's a tension here in the sense that much of the business reporting is focused on financial markets. And there's no doubt the Fed's interest rate decisions are important for financial markets. But for most of us, we don't really care. We don't have a lot of money in financial markets. We might have a 401k, but most of us aren't playing with it. If we do, you know, you put it in an index fund, whatever. I mean, you're not checking it day to day. Maybe some people do, but they're not moving. You know, so so for most people, the financial markets are not a big factor in the economy. Now, things that happen in the financial market can be big factors. So if we get a huge surge in interest rates, we did get a big run up in mortgage rates. If you want to buy a home, that's a big deal. If you're looking to refinance your home, that's a big deal. But even then, it's still the less important part of the economy. The important part of the economy, do people have jobs? Are they seeing pay increases? And issue you mentioned, the student loans. We're talking about 40 million people that Biden had planned to give a substantial reduction in their debt, 20,000 for those that had Pell Grants, which is a lot of people, and 10,000 for everyone else. It's a big deal. The Supreme Court just said no. So when you talk about the economy, for most people, that probably is much more important than than what happens with the Fed's interest rate decision, at least in the short term. People are going to have to start paying back their student loans. Tens of thousands of people are going to have to start paying back their student loans in September. Is that the kind of thing that actually makes a blip that is not to the individual, but to the economy as a whole? After it having been on pause for however long. Yeah. It will, it will have, yeah, just to be clear, it went on pause at the start of the pandemic back in uh, April, I think, was when they pushed through the, the pause uh, in uh, April of 220. So it's been quite some time. Anyhow, um, it will have some impact. I don't think it'll be huge for two reasons. One is the absolute amount that people are paying. It's a lot to them. It's not 
that large to the economy. The other, and this we're going to have to see how it plays out, um, Biden has proposed, I shouldn't say proposed, he's implemented a, a, a much more generous um, income driven repayment plan. This had been present for years, it was under Obama. People had to pay, I believe it was 10% of their income above a cutoff that was one and a half times the poverty threshold. I'm using rough numbers here. So for an in individual, single person, that'd be roughly 20,000. So you'd pay 10% of your income above that. So let's say you don't make very much money, you're working in a restaurant or something, you make 30,000 a year, you'd pay 10% of the income above the 20,000. So 10% of 10,000, you pay a thousand a year, not trivial, but you know, that might, that for many people be much, much less than what they would have to pay on their normal schedule. Now, Biden reduced that to 5% and he made the cutoff double the poverty level. So in this case, it'd be 24,000. So our person earning 30,000 a year, they'd be paying 5% of the difference between 30,000 and 24,000, $6,000. They'd pay $300 a year. Uh, again, I'm not going to say it's trivial, but much less than they paid under right. the old plan. So if that is widely adopted, and problem with the old plan, a lot of people didn't know about it. I talked to people complaining about their student loans. I go, I understand that, but how come you're not in the income? And they go, huh? You know, so. <laughs> because Sally have, May didn't tell me about that for 25 yeah, years. That's why. It, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So they really have to make a point of getting people into this plan so that people who can benefit from it know about it. And if that happens, that really will ameliorate the hit in a really big way. Um, Back to the interest rates, doesn't the increase in interest rates hit certain people more than others? And there are there other ways we could stem inflation without relying would I on what I consider a fallacy that the interest rates are the only thing that we can do? Well, there's a few things here. I mean, the intent of the Fed in raising rates is to slow the economy. And what they're trying to do is fewer jobs, to put it bluntly. That's, you know, and I, I don't think, you know, Powell would probably try and use more graceful wording, but that's what he's trying to do, fewer jobs. And that means reducing workers' bargaining power and particularly workers at the bottom end of the, the wage distribution. This is one of the things we've seen. Uh, my friend Aaron Dubé is at UMass. He's written several pieces on this, David Otter and um, Annie McGrew, I believe is her name, a third author, that showed that in, in this recovery, in the, in, since the pandemic, there's been a huge wage gains at the bottom end of the wage distribution. And that's because we've had this very tight labor market. Now, as the labor market gets looser. It hasn't in a big way yet, but you know, if it does, then they lose that bargaining power and they won't be able to get the same wage gain. So you'll both see higher unemployment. So the people are most likely to lose their jobs are people with less education, disproportionately minorities, blacks lose their jobs, people who have uh, criminal records, they aren't going to get hired. So it's people at the bottom that pay the biggest price. Now, what else can we do? There are a lot of other things we could do, but the problem is if you ask Jerome Powell, he's going to go, what I could do is raise interest rates. And he's right. And that's, <laughs> that, that's what he could do. So are there other things we could do? Well, Congress could look to lower drug prices. I mean, President Biden has tried to do that, but he's limited authority. Um, you could have, and, and there are a lot of proposals for this, including from very centrist economists during the uh, run-up in oil prices, you could have had a windfall profits tax. You know, Wait a minute. Reduce Wait a minute. Hold on. We're all on that many drugs that if we reduce, <laughs> if we reduce, I understand the oil thing. We all have to use it for gasoline in the car, et cetera, heating our homes, but, um, or cooling them as it, as it were that I, walk me through how many drugs we're on and how that would have the effect, uh, uh that we're looking for that would be positive. We're going to spend on the order of $550 billion this year on prescription drugs. And a huge amount of that is markup because it's very rare yeah. that it's expensive to manufacture and distribute. My, my rough estimate is if, if we got rid of all the protections, because patents are the big thing here, but if we got rid of all the protections for prescription drugs, instead of spending $550 billion, we'd spend about $100 billion. Okay. It, it's, it's a huge difference. So, you know, obviously we're not going to do that overnight. Um, I don't know if we'll ever do it. But, you know, the point is there, there's a lot of room to lower drug prices. And because we spend so much, that that would be a big share of, you know, people's 
people's budgets. Now, for the most part, most drugs are paid for indirectly in the sense that most of us have insurance, either through private insurance or the government. So we're not paying at least the full cost of the drugs. But that gets passed through. The insurance companies, as we know, are not run as charities. So if they have to pay more for drugs, they're charging higher premiums. So yeah, so that that's, you know, again, there are other things. I mentioned that because that's a big one, an obvious one. But But that's, you know, those are the sorts of things that you could look to do. You know, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that you might look to do more long term. I mean, uh, housing's a huge expense. We had a big run up in uh, housing prices, rent prices in, in the pandemic, um, building more housing. Well, we can't do that tomorrow. Um, we can do that. You can have rent controls. People have asked me about that. I think in a lot of cases, that's a good thing. I don't think you could do it nationally because we don't have the right. we don't have the the enforcement mechanisms. So if you just say, oh, we're going to control rents nationwide. Well, how are you going to do that? You need people on the ground. Right. So they're playing. The Washington Post just reported yesterday that rent prices are, you know, going down, maybe hitting pre-pandemic levels. Pre-pandemic, the rent, especially in New York City, where I was at the time, was exorbitant anyway. It's yeah, I don't no, think, you, how can they report this as good news? It was already at the tale of two cities. Well, it's <laughs> better news than if they were still rising at you know eight nine percent a year. So so getting uh, lower rates of growth that that that's good in that context. But sure, we'd love to see lower rents in New York, San Francisco, many other places in the country where they've gone through the roof. And you know, the, I will say one of the things that's come out of the pandemic, we've had this huge increase in work from home. There are estimates that somewhere around thirty percent of work days are work from home. Now a lot of people go in the office a day, two days. So that means they can't be the other side of the country like me. But, you know, but uh, but it has opened up a possibility where people don't have to be in New York City to I work like in New York City. Yeah. yeah. So so that <laughs> yep. that that will alleviate some pressure on rents. Doesn't mean it'll be cheap, but it will be cheaper than it otherwise would be, is I guess how I'd put it. It's really interesting. You spoke a minute ago about the housing market and um, just keeping that keeping those interest rates high certain people that that edges them out of a housing market especially people who are either first time home buyers or trying to make that leap into ownership and then you've got all of these banks and flippers and corporation you know banks basically buying up housing stock just to rent it back out to people it Seems like the increase in interest rates really benefits those those uh, companies. Am I am I missing a point here? Well, it certainly hurts people who are trying to buy a home. You know, so if you're a first time buyer and you're looking at a seven percent mortgage rate, I haven't checked what they are. They're somewhere around there. You know, obviously it fluctuates day to day, but in any case, we're looking at somewhere around seven percent as opposed to three percent um, back a year and a half ago. So that's a you know obviously a huge huge difference. It's not clear that that necessarily benefits the you know the corporate owners. I mean, they 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 were making money either way. Um, I should also point out they don't always make the right calls. I'm trying to think. What, I don't think it was Blackstone. One of the ones that got in in a really big way. It could have been Blackstone. I have to go back and check. But in any case, one of the PE companies, private equity companies, that got into housing in a big way. They're getting out. You know, so they decided it wasn't a good deal for them. So they were buying up lots of homes around the country and renting them out. And they they ended up uh, apparently, you know, made the call that that was a real profitable line of business. So I, I think we're wrong if we assume everything they get into, they make lots of money on it. Obviously, that's their intention. That's why they get into it. But they actually aren't always winners. They've made the housing market into a big disaster, at least over here on the east side of the country, because... Um, when you go to look for a place, you can't, you have to make the bid immediately without contingency and without inspection. That's what's happening in some of the markets because people are moving out of New York City. So you wind up taking a big risk because those companies and also people with cash bids or more money than you are bidding people up, 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 up. And it's a, it's just really hard for people who are I've been covering it. Uh, people who are trying to get in or people who have, you know, a, don't necessarily have the money to spend five hundred thousand dollars on. I always call it like a a one bedroom, two outhouse shack. In, in 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, it is a mixed story. And one of the things I was struck by, because, you know, I, I was one of the people yelling about the housing bubble back in 2005, six, seven. And, you know, so a lot of people were asking me, were we, were we in a housing bubble in 220, 221? We were seeing house prices run up a lot. And I was saying I didn't think it was a bubble because that, that really reflected the fundamentals of the market. We didn't have enough housing. And, 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 but it did start to look like a bubble to me. And one of the things I was struck by, so this is later in 221 into 222, that as soon as the Fed did their first rate hike, that was March of last year, it just stopped. You know, so there's data on, you know, number of offers per listing. I think it's Redfin who keeps this, you know, the realty company. And it went from everything getting three or four offers in the first week to a lot of places sitting there for weeks with no offers. And that, you know, the implication of that is it, it slowed the rise in the housing prices and they actually dipped in a lot of places. So in that sense, I think the Fed raising rates is really a good thing. Now, now that you're looking at 7% mortgages, well, that's, that's the trade-off. So maybe you'd be in a story where if they hadn't been raising rates like this, we would have seen prices rise another 10, 15%, but you can get a mortgage for three and a half or 4%. So are you better off? I, I I think they made the right call in raising rates. Did they have to go as far as they did? That that I think is an open question. I guess we'll see how things turn out. But you said in um, your recent article that uh, you were afraid that they were just going to keep on raising. Why would they do such a thing? It's you know I think that would be a bad mistake on their part. And you know the question is you know what are the relative risks? So I look at the data and I go, okay, you guys want to get inflation down? You did. You know, inflation is, it's not, they have a 2% target. It's about 2%, but it's moving in that direction. We're close to 2%. And let's say we're at 3%. To my view, if you're at 3% and the direction changes downwards, you're going towards 2% to say, okay, we're going to keep raising rates because it's not going down fast enough. That would be close to crazy. But I am worried that there are people at the Fed, I hope not Jerome Powell, but I know there are people at the Fed who think like that. And that's that I think is a really big problem. So I think one of the big concerns, at least one of the big concerns I have, is they keep raising rates. And th there's no doubt at some point you raise rates enough, you'll get a recession. I don't, you know, I've been surprised the economy hasn't taken more of a hit from the rate hikes today to date, but there's no doubt. Raise them another percentage point, another two per you you'll get a recession at some point there. Where it is, I can't say, you know, hmm. but definitely at some point you'll get a recession. Are these when the rates go up, how immediate do you feel that? Isn't there a kind of a buffer of time between Yeah, and that's again one of the things that you know has been debated among economists because there's a literature on this that says, you know, 16 to 16 months, 18 months to two years to feel the full effect. Whether that's always true, whether we could extrapolate from the past is hard to say. I mean, obviously, the future is always somewhat different than the past. But what we've seen is very, very different patterns. Typically, what the way the Fed's interest rate hikes affect the economy is most directly through housing. And there has been a reduction in housing starts, mm. but they haven't fallen that much. And the other thing is housing under construction is actually higher today than it was in March of last year when they started raising rates. And the reason for that was we had such a backlog in the in the pandemic, the supply chain problems, people couldn't finish houses. So you have all these half built homes that they're they're trying to finish now. So that means construction employment's actually increased in the in Wait, as, where as the are all these people coming from? Like are we having a population explosion that's I mean, are there not enough people dying that the younger people who want to buy where are all these people who want houses coming from? Well, I think the big thing, and again, there's been some good research pointing out, pointing this out, is that people, when they made the decision to work from home, they they were being able to work from home. They wanted more space in the uh, home office. So some right. of them had a one bedroom apartment, moves to a two bedroom, three bedroom house. You know, so so that sort of thing. So people wanted more space, and that that I think created big demand. Yeah. And, and hmm. you know, we, we've we've come to the end of that big surge in the sense that, you know, with this huge number of people, I forget what the figure was before the pandemic, like five or six, 7% work from home. Now it's around 30%. So we had this huge surge. I don't expect that to go back. I mean, you know, maybe it could drop a percent or two point or two percentage points, but it's not going to go back to where it was, but we're also not going to see a further surge like that. So the demand for housing is going to ease up. And again, we're finishing a lot of units. So again, we couldn't finish uh, because of the supply chain issues. We weren't finishing units during the pandemic. They're finishing them now. So again, that will help to alleviate 
you know, the, 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 the excess demand. But again, that's not an overnight story and you're still going to have real high rents in New York. I mean, that's how, <laughs> that, that just rent. never ends. That's just yeah. the story yeah. of New York is uh, yeah. the rents too damn high. As I said earlier, um, Dean, as you know, we've all been living through these really catastrophic, um, climate uh, things, the heat wave, uh, climate changes upon us, climate chaos is upon us. When, you know, I, you said that we haven't necessarily seen an, a, a measurable economic impact in the United States, that it's been relatively limited. Those were your words from your yeah. most recent article. Now, how can you say that? The Barbie movie grossed 500 plus million dollars so far. I attribute that to climate change because people in Phoenix and elsewhere couldn't go outside. So they all just went to the air conditioned movies. How How is it that, that we, with everything that's been going on, we haven't seen this impacting the economy? Well, it does have an impact. It's just not that large in the scheme of things, at least not that large yet. Um, it's clearly growing and it's, you know, we, we will see these things. So Florida, they have a enormous problem with their insurance market. A number of insurers have pulled out of Florida, their home insurance, they won't insure and, you know, try and buy a house, you know, get a mortgage. If you don't have insurance, you can't, I mean, no one's going to give you a mortgage if you don't have insurance. Similar story in California. Um, so we're, we're going to see this more and more places and what that's going to mean my guess, actually, they've already done something like this in Florida. I gather it'll be something comparable in, in California. The state will subsidize it, but obviously that's an expense. And, you know, as as climate damage increases, which it will, then that expense is going to be greater and greater. Um, in terms of, you know, the heat waves in Texas, people will have a hell of a time working outside. It's really horrible. Now, is that a economic impact? Well, if they're still working, I guess not, but it's horrible for those people. People get sick, people die. I mean, it's, you know, we're talking really horrible stories. And it, it's, to my view, it, it, we used to talk, or uh, I'm not gonna implicate myself because I didn't say this, but there were people who would say, well, we have a choice, climate or the economy. But no, it's not a choice. We're gonna pay the price. So it's just how you do it. and. We could either be more aggressive in spending on pushing clean energy, converting to clean energy, or we could just say, okay, whatever, we're just going to burn the planet. And you know, unfortunately, we've gone so far down that path, there's no way to prevent an enormous amount of damage to the to the planet. We're seeing it, and it's, yeah, I mean, to my view, it's just horrible. I mean, the you know, the human cost, and also, you know, most of us care about nature. You just see. There's an article today in one of the papers about the coral reefs in Florida. They're yeah. dying because the water is too hot, you know, and coral reefs support all sorts of life. So it's just it, it's a really horrible thing to see. And, you know, I, I'm hoping we are moving towards, you know, and I give Biden credit for that. We are moving towards adopting clean energy at a much more rapid pace. But, you know, we really have to call on, you know, pull out all the stops and go full speed here. If he does. um feel the pressure that people are putting on their electeds for calling a climate emergency, what would he be able, would, would the Green New Deal or things like the Green New Deal, is it a fallacy that they can uh, both stimulate the economy and turn us away from this apocalyptic climate death we're all staring down? Well, they could do more, but that's really going to require congressional action. I mean, Biden, I think, is, you know, and he's looking. I know people in his administration, they're always looking to do more things to try and promote clean energy, electric cars. So they are trying to do that. But what he could do with simple executive authority, he, he's pushing that as far as he can. You mm -hmm. know, and again, the Supreme Court's prepared to jump down on him because, you know, they, they, they support climate change. And, you know, <laughs> they support um, executive authority when it comes to Republicans. That's yes, yes. Yes. They have a different view of executive authority when there's a Democrat in the White House. I think that's clear. Yeah. Um, well, I, this is all, I, I'm glad to know you because I look forward to parsing this. I personally think we're much closer to enormous climate catastrophes that are going to have people, you know, full cities. Well, well, one of the things, that, you know, that we should be aware of, uh, the worst effects of climate change are actually in developing countries. And, you know, people here don't see that. It doesn't get much attention, but like in Pakistan last year, the, the flooding, 
uh, like a third of the country was underwater. And Pakistan's got about 200 million people. So it's, it's a very densely populated country. Sub-Saharan Africa, places that used to be arable, you know, people grew food, they fed their cattle. Um, they're desert now. The desert's moving south. So the, the worst impact of climate change is in the developing world, which, again, part of the irony there, they didn't do it. Yeah, you know, you know, it was us. It was us. It was Europe. You know, the rich countries were the ones who put all the stuff in the atmosphere. They didn't do it, but they're paying the price. Yeah, that is, that is, uh, an injustice that we're seeing. Um, Dean, uh, you said final thing. Uh, any good, any good uh, person on the left is happy, generally speaking. Hopefully, when we talk about. Uh, gains for labor, gains for the working man and woman and person. Uh, the Teamsters secured big gains at UPS not too long ago. Starbucks is organizing. But you said that it, and I'm quoting you here, if increased labor militancy is able to secure larger wage gains, this some of this is going to be passed on in higher prices. That's going to keep fueling inflation. How much further past six dollars for a small latte can will the market <laughs> will the market hold? I mean, at some point, won't people just not want that stuff? Well, it, yeah, I'm sure that everything They're passing has it on to the people thing. instead of cutting, it, you know, the executive compensation and well, those well, kind to, of things. To be clear, the dynamic here: if you see if companies see higher labor costs, higher pay, you know, they're paying their workers more. Um, they will undoubtedly absorb some of that lower margins, but they will also pass some of that on in higher prices. I don't think there's any two ways about it. So if suddenly, you know, Starbucks has to pay everyone 20% more, which should be good. I'd love to see that, but you know, they are going to raise prices. They may not raise them 20%. How? We hope not. $8 but... for oat milk. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it ain't right is all I have to say. I was, you know, I heard in a foreign land uh, that a coffee and espresso in Italy, in Sicily, on the beach, so comes with uh, comes with scenery. <laughs> it, it's is two euros. So I don't get. <laughs> I just don't get how how much how much people are going to spend ten dollars for a coffee here. It just doesn't seem. I, I wouldn't do it, but you know, I'm not their normal their their standard customer. Cold day in hell. I'm at Starbucks, but. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a hot day in Phoenix. Um, yeah. Dean Baker, thank you so much. It's always great to have you here. I really appreciate you coming and, and giving us a, a general rundown about all the things. And I look forward to um, parsing out what's going on as we continue to face. Well, we're facing, you know, the Republicans are going to try to do spending cuts again, right? In September, yeah. trying to yeah. do the whole government. They're leaving us on vacation for August. They're going on vacation when we get home. We're going to get, you know, slapped in the face with shutting down the government. So, yep, yep, that's a safe bet. So. Well, we'll talk to you about that then. How about that? Fair <laughs> enough. Thanks Sounds so good. much, Dean. Dean Baker, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, Center for Economic Policy Research. Beat the press. Follow him on Twitter. We'll be right back. You're watching the Juliana Forlano Show on the Political Voices Network. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. This has been the Juliana Forlano Show on the Political Voices Network, wherever you're watching. I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe. Obviously, we're a new show, so we're building and building. And leaving a comment helps, too. So I'd appreciate that. First of all, I love to read them. Second of all, it helps the algorithm push this kind of info out through the fog and maze of online disinformation that is there. Thanks so much. I will see you next week.